Can you commit the perfect crime against reality? Imagine I hand you a solid gold ball. Now, using a mathematically perfect knife, you make exactly five cuts. You now have a few strange-looking pieces. You take those pieces, and you reassemble them. Not into one gold ball, but into two gold balls. Each one is solid. Each one is the exact same size as the one you started with. You have duplicated matter. You have violated the fundamental laws of the universe. You have, quite literally, gotten something from nothing. And here's the terrifying part. According to the pristine, unbreakable logic of mathematics, this is 100% possible. It's a proven theorem called the Bonnik-Tarski paradox. But if you walked into any physics lab on Earth and tried to do it, every scientist would laugh you out of the room. Not because it's hard. Because it's so fundamentally impossible it breaks reality itself. So we have a suspect. A conflict. A cosmic crime scene. Mathematics, our language for describing the universe, says yes. Physics, our law book for how the universe actually works, says an emphatic no. What's the source of this profound disagreement? A single, powerful, and deeply seductive idea. The idea of infinity. Tonight, we are not just exploring a concept. We are conducting an audit. We are putting infinity itself on trial. And by the end, we will have a verdict. Is infinity a fundamental truth of our universe? Or the most beautiful lie we ever told ourselves? Before we bring in the prosecution, we have to understand the suspect. We have to visit the world where infinity is not a paradox but a paradise. The world of pure mathematics. Here, infinity isn't a vague notion of a lot. It is a precise, rigorous entity. In fact, there isn't just one infinity, there's an entire zoo of them, of different sizes. It's a shocking idea, the thought that one endlessness can be bigger than another endlessness, but that's where our journey begins. Meet the most basic version, countable infinity. Imagine the whole numbers, one, two, three, one hundred, a million, a billion, marching on forever. You can't ever get to the end, but you can at least imagine a process for counting them. They're like an infinitely long line of people waiting to get into a concert. You can point to each one and give them a number. This concept, simple as it sounds, lets us build the most extraordinary structure in all of thought experiments, Hilbert's Grand Hotel. Picture it. A glorious, art deco hotel that stretches upwards and onwards forever. It has a countably infinite number of rooms, room one, room two, on and on. Tonight, the hotel is completely full. An infinite number of guests are asleep in their infinite beds. The neon no vacancy sign is humming. Then, at midnight, a weary traveler arrives seeking a room. The night manager, a calm mathematician, doesn't even blink. He gets on the hotel-wide intercom. Attention esteemed guests, his voice echoes down the endless hallway. Could you please do me a favor? Could each of you please gather your belongings and move from your current room, room N, to the room next door, room N plus one? There's a cosmic shuffling. The guest in room 1 moves to room 2. The guest in room 2 moves to room 3. The guest in room 1 million moves to room 1 million and 1. Since there is no last room to worry about, every single guest finds a new, empty room waiting for them. And just like that, with a simple announcement, room 1 is now vacant. The new traveler checks in, and the infinite hotel is once again, paradoxically, full. But our manager's night is just beginning. A moment later, a bus pulls up. It's a very, very long bus. An infinitely long bus, carrying a countably infinite number of new passengers, all needing a room. An amateur would panic. But our mathematician just smiles, sips his coffee, and gets back on the intercom. Apologies for the second disturbance, he says, but could I ask for your cooperation once more? Would every guest in their current room in, please move to the room number 2N? Again, the cosmic shuffle. The guest in room 1 moves to room 2. The guest in room 2 moves to room 4. The guest in room 3 moves to room 6. What just happened? All the existing guests have been moved into the even-numbered rooms. Which means, all of the odd-numbered rooms are now empty. 1, 3, 5, 7, an infinite number of vacancies for the infinite number of people on the bus. In the world of math, you can have a full hotel and still have infinite room to spare. This is the clean, logical, and deeply weird world infinity builds. But this isn't even the most powerful version of it. The mathematician George Cantor discovered an infinity so vast, so dense, it makes Hilbert's endless hotel look like a child's toy. He found the uncountable infinity. It's not a line of people. It's a thick, seamless ocean. Cantor looked at the number line, specifically at all the numbers between 0 and 1. Not just the clean fractions like 1, 2, or 3, 4, but all of them. 0 0.314, 0 0.87529, 
every possible string of digits after the decimal point, stretching on forever. He asked the revolutionary question, could we list them all out, even if our list was infinitely long? Could we count them like we counted the hotel guests? He proved, with one of the most beautiful arguments in history, that the answer is an explosive NO. He asked you to imagine this infinite list exists. Your list of every possible decimal number. Then, like a magician revealing a trick, he creates a number that he guarantees is not on your list. He constructs it right before your eyes. He looks at the first digit after the decimal of your first number. Let's say it's a 2. He writes down a 3. Then he goes to the second digit of your second number. Maybe it's a 9. He writes down a 0. He continues this forever, going down the diagonal of your infinite list, and at every step, he just picks a different digit. The number he creates is a phantom. A ghost in your machine. It can't be your first number, because it's different in the first decimal place. It can't be your second number, because it differs in the second place. It can't be your trillionth number, because it differs in the trillionth place. Your list, which you claimed was complete, is not. You have failed. Any list you could possibly make would fail. The conclusion is earth-shattering. There are fundamentally, provably more points between zero and one than there are whole numbers stretching to infinity. It is a bigger, higher order of infinity. The infinity of the continuum. This smooth, unbroken continuum is the bedrock of physics. It's the canvas on which Newton and Einstein painted their masterpieces. It is the deep water in which quantum mechanics swims. Our science is built on this dream of a perfectly smooth, infinitely divisible reality. So if math is so certain, so elegant, so sure of itself, why did we say there was a crime scene? The crime scene appears the moment you try to take any of these perfect ideas and build them in the real world. Because our universe plays by different rules. In physics, nothing is free. Every action, every object, every bit of information has a cost. And infinity is an invoice the cosmos refuses to pay. Let's return to Hilbert's hotel, but this time, let's hire an engineer, not a mathematician. We want to actually build it. First, the materials. Infinite rooms require infinite steel, infinite concrete, infinite glass, infinite wiring. What is the mass of an infinitely large building? It's infinite. What happens when you gather an infinite amount of mass in one place? Long before room 1 billion is complete, the hotel's own gravitational pull would become so overwhelming that it would light on fire, rip itself apart, and collapse into a super 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 massive black hole. The hotel wouldn't just have no vacancy. It would become a singularity, a point of infinite density from which nothing can escape. Your hotel is now a cosmic prison. Okay, let's say you magically build it. What about the power? An infinite number of rooms with lights, air conditioning, and mini fridges requires an infinite amount of energy. The laws of thermodynamics would like a word. And what about that elegant coordination trick? The manager asking everyone to move rooms. That announcement is information. In our universe, information cannot travel faster than the speed of light. To get the message to the guest in room 300 trillion would take, well over 30,000 years. For the entire infinite chain of guests to be notified would take an infinite amount of time. The plan is not just impractical, it's impossible. It violates the fundamental causality of the universe. This is exhibit A for the prosecution. What is logically consistent in the paradise of the mind becomes a physical monstrosity in the world of atoms and energy. But the problem is even deeper. It's not just that we can't build infinite things. It seems the universe won't even let us calculate with them. Quantum field theory is humanity's most successful physical theory. It describes the world of subatomic particles with breathtaking accuracy. But to do so, it is built on that smooth, continuous space-time from mathematics. It treats fundamental particles, like the electron, as perfect, dimensionless points. This seemingly innocent assumption led to a decades-long crisis in physics. Because if an electron has a charge, but has zero size, its charge density is infinite. The energy of its own electric field, the force it exerts upon its own non-existent self, calculates out to infinity. For years, the theories kept screaming this impossible answer. It was a mathematical plague. It was like building a flawless engine that, the moment you turn the key, explodes. So how did physicists solve this? They performed one of the most brilliant, and controversial, acts of intellectual surgery in history. They swept the infinity under the rug. The procedure is called renormalization. And it is, at its heart, an admission of ignorance. The physicists said, okay, Clearly our theory breaks down at some incredibly tiny, almost infinitely small distance. We don't have a theory for what goes on there. So let's just draw a line. We'll put in a cutoff. 
We'll say our equations only work down to this line, and we will refuse to ask questions about what lies beyond it. Imagine you have a digital photograph of a beautiful landscape. It looks smooth and perfect. But if you keep zooming in, eventually you hit the pixel level. The illusion of smoothness is broken. Renormalization is like saying, we know the pixels are there, but our job is to describe the landscape, not the pixels. So we will make our calculations in a way that doesn't depend on the pixel size. They bundle up all the messy infinities that arise from the point particle assumption and hide them inside the values we can actually measure in a lab, like the electron's mass and charge. It works. It works so well it's almost terrifying. It gives us predictions that match experiments to a dozen decimal places. But it is a ghost in the machine. It is a constant reminder that the smooth, continuous infinity of mathematics might just be a low-resolution approximation of a much grainier, pixelated reality. We got the right answer by strategically ignoring an infinity. The evidence against the truly infinite reality gets even stronger when we leave energy behind and start auditing information. Because it seems the universe has a storage limit. A hard drive that can, in fact, get full. This clue comes from the most extreme object we know of, the black hole. For a long time, black holes represented a profound puzzle called the information paradox. If you throw a book into a black hole, is the information in that book, the words, the story, destroyed forever? The laws of physics scream and oh, information cannot be destroyed. But how could it possibly escape a black hole? While wrestling with this, Jacob Bekenstein and Stephen Hawking uncovered a law of nature so profound we are still grappling with it. They discovered that the total amount of information a black hole can hold is proportional to its surface area, the two-dimensional area of its event horizon. This should completely break your brain. You'd think that the storage capacity of any object would depend on its volume. A bigger suitcase holds more clothes. A bigger hard drive holds more data. But the universe's ultimate vault says no. Its capacity is written on its skin, not in its guts. This was later generalized into something called the holographic principle. It states that the information content of any volume of space in the entire universe can be fully encoded on its two-dimensional boundary. And most importantly, that amount of information is always, always a finite number. There is no such thing as infinite information density. Try to violate this principle. Take a box and start trying to shove more and more information-carrying particles into it. You add one more, then one more. At some point, you will have packed so much mass and energy into that volume that it will reach a critical density and... Whoosh! It will collapse into a black hole. And the surface area of that brand new black hole will be just large enough to store the bits of information you tried to overstuff inside. The universe has a built-in error correction. Its final defense against infinity is to create an event horizon. It's a cosmic firewall. This suggests that reality at its most fundamental level might be like a hologram. Our three-dimensional experience might be a projection of information stored on some distant two-dimensional surface. And the resolution of that hologram is finite. We may live in a universe that appears smooth and continuous. But if you could look deep enough, you might find that it's all just pixels on a cosmic screen. So, if reality is made of pixels, how small are they? Welcome to the absolute edge of known physics. A realm of such infinitesimal scale that numbers lose their meaning. We're talking about the Planck scale. The Planck length is 10 to the power of minus 35 meters. It is a distance so monumentally small that if you were to expand a single atom to be the size of our entire observable universe, the Planck length would be about the height of a tree. It is here that the laws of gravity and the laws of quantum mechanics, the two pillars of modern physics, are predicted to wage war. Now, we must be clear. We have not proven that space-time is a grid of pixels this size. But the Planck scale acts as the universe's final, cryptic warning sign. A cosmic here be dragons on the map of reality. And the warning is this, you cannot measure anything smaller than this. Let's say you tried. You build the most powerful microscope imaginable. To see smaller and smaller things, you need to use probes with shorter and shorter wavelengths, which means higher and higher energy. To see down to the Planck length, the energy you would need to focus into that single, tiny point would be immense. And what have we learned happens when you concentrate a huge amount of energy into a tiny volume? That's right. You create a black hole. The very act of trying to measure if there's anything smaller than the Planck length creates an event horizon that shields that region from your view. The universe fights back. It censors the information you're looking for. It is the ultimate catch-22. Reality itself refuses to be measured with infinite precision. This gives us a stunning, modern answer to an ancient paradox. The Greek philosopher Zeno wondered how an arrow could ever reach its target. To get there, 
It must first travel half the distance. Then it must travel half of the remaining distance. Then half of that. And so on, forever. An infinite number of tasks. How can it ever be completed? Calculus answered this by showing an infinite series can have a finite sum. But physics now gives a more profound answer. The arrow does not have an infinite number of stages to its journey. There is a smallest possible step it can take. There is a final pixel. Zeno's paradox dissolves because the infinite divisibility he assumed doesn't exist. This idea is no longer just a philosophical curiosity. It's at the heart of our most advanced attempts to unify physics. String theory replaces point particles with tiny, vibrating strings that have a minimum size, resolving many of the infinities. Loop quantum gravity goes even further and describes space-time itself as a network, a fabric woven from finite, indivisible loops. At this level, there are no smooth lines. There are only connections. There is no continuum. There is only the count. We have audited the books. The evidence has been presented. Let us now come to a verdict in the case of infinity versus reality. The prosecution has shown that every time we try to instantiate a physical infinity, the universe rebels. Hilbert's hotel collapses into a black hole. Our quantum theories explode with infinities until we manually cut them off. The Bonnik-Tarski paradox requires infinitely precise cuts that atoms and energy simply cannot perform. At every turn, physics presents us with firewalls, the speed of light, the holographic bound, and the Planck scale. Infinity, it seems, is a perfect and beautiful tool of the mind. It is perhaps the most powerful abstraction humanity has ever conceived. It allows us to calculate the arc of a planet and the behavior of a wave. But it appears to be a property of our maps, not of the territory itself. We draw the world with smooth, unbroken lines because it's an incredibly good approximation. But the evidence overwhelmingly suggests that the territory itself is written in a finite alphabet. So what does this mean for us? For you? Living in a universe that might not be infinite? Think of a human life. It is finite. Your time is finite. The number of heartbeats you have is finite. The number of memories you can store is finite. For a long time, we have been told this is a tragedy. But maybe. It is the very source of meaning. An infinite life would have no urgency. An infinite memory would have no focus. It's the finite nature of your memory that forces you to choose what is important. The story of your life is powerful because it is an edit, a compression, a highlighting of the moments that mattered against the backdrop of all the ones that didn't. Precision has a cost. Detail has a weight. A finite universe, a finite life, does not have to be a prison. Perhaps it is the very thing that gives the walls of our existence their shape, and the moments within them their precious, unrepeatable value. The cosmos may not write with infinite ink, but it seems to have authored a story that is, nevertheless, profound. We started with a simple question, is infinity real? The audit is in, and the evidence points to a stunning NO. But this raises a profound final question I want to ask you, for the comments. Does the idea of a finite reality, one with a final pixel, a last moment, and a limited set of rules, make you feel more trapped by its limits, or more grounded by its concreteness? There's no right answer. Let me know your gut reaction below. And if you enjoy wrestling with these kinds of fundamental questions about the nature of reality, you are going to be fascinated by the video that's on your screen right now. It takes on another one of science's deepest puzzles. Click and I'll see you over there. Finally, this is what we do at the Science Audit. We challenge assumptions and explore the deepest mysteries in the cosmos every single day. If you believe these are some of the most important conversations we can have, make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications. Your support is not just appreciated, it is fundamental. Thanks for watching.